So before I get started, you guys, the camera is going to be facing this way, so you guys are totally not going to see my cute, adorable cats in the background of this video, but look at them all snuggled up there. I almost feel like changing my camera angle just so you can see them. Aren't they sweet? Anyhow, let's get down to business. Hi guys! Welcome to another episode of Scrap Chat. I have a bunch of questions from you guys. I'm going to start by answering all of the questions that I had left on my last Scrap Chat, which was way back in October of 2016. So I have three questions from then, and then I also have a whole bunch of, of uh, questions here on my computer that people left me in the last day or so. Uh, because I put out a notice on Facebook that I was going to be doing another scrap chat. So um, let's just start at the very beginning. So I don't know, I, I forgot to write down the name of the person, but somebody uh, asked me about their ATG roller. And uh, because I think it was because in my last video, I had mentioned someone had asked why did I switch from the ATG to uh, these little guys, these scrapbook adhesive, uh, and basically I didn't have a reason. It's not like my ATG. I wasn't unhappy with my ATG, but I just wanted to try something new to let you guys know what I thought of it. And also it's smaller and it's a little bit easier to, you know, it kind of gets lost on your desk, but it's also not so bulky. So sometimes I find I put down my ATG and then it covers stuff and then I'm pulling stuff out from under it and then the ATG falls onto the ground so I don't have to worry so much when I use a little one. There's pros and cons to using a big giant one and a little one. The biggest reason that I like to use a big uh, tape roller is that it doesn't have to be refilled as, as often and I do go through a lot of adhesive so there's a whole monster of a roll on this one whereas this one has more of a regular sized roll. And so all of this brings me to the question which again I can't remember who left it but thank you for your question uh, and I thought I would answer it because I've heard this question asked on different forums like back on when two peas in a bucket was going and some other places like there's another two peas forum now and I hear people asking this question all the time so I thought I would just let you know my few thoughts on this issue because I have few. Um, basically the question was, let's just get to the question now Tracy, uh, trouble keeping the ATG on the roller. So it sounds like this person isn't the only one because I've heard this before but it sounds like there are times when this tape falls off the roller like kind of falls off like that like it would kind of make its way as you use it over and over and then slip off. I don't have any suggestions for you because I've never had that happen. I've never even had that almost happen. And it, I can't help but wonder if maybe you have a defective ATG or if, or if maybe there's something wrong with the way that it's threaded or I'm not entirely sure. I do have a video that shows you how to thread this uh, sucker, but I think that having this piece on there is really key, and I have put this back together again without this piece, and it, um, it, it will seemingly work, but I wonder if that might be the thing. So basically, there's a piece that looks like this that goes right over this right here, and so I... And then you just slip it back in place. I have a video that shows how to refill your ATG. And um, most people say that that's a really helpful video. So check that out if you don't know how to uh, refill your ATG. But it sounds like this person does know how. So I'm guessing that you probably do have it threaded properly. If you're asking me, you've probably searched around and asked. Um, I would contact Scotch about it because it's really not supposed to happen. And these things aren't cheap, so when you invest that much money into a tool, you want it to work, and to work reliably too, right? So I would contact them and try to f troubleshoot it, or maybe they'll replace it for you. I don't know. Um, I love mine, and I've, like I said, I've never ever had that happen. And I've used the both the Scotch brand and also the Off brand, whatever the no-name version is that's circulating around out there. Um, I've used both of them and never ever had that problem. So. Um, if 
The other reason I wanted to uh, address this question, even though I don't have an answer to it, is that lots of other people watch this. And so if anybody out there watching this has a solution or any thoughts or ideas or experience with your ATG tape falling off the roller, please leave a message below to help this person and anybody else who might be running into this problem because I have not, I did Google it and I looked around and um, couldn't find a good solution for you. So, uh, so hopefully this will at least let you know that that's not supposed to happen and maybe somebody else will have something to say. So thank you for your question. Uh, even though I didn't know how to answer it, I hope that that helps in some small way. Then my good friend Shell had a question for me in my last scrap chat. She said, how do you store stencils without them getting all scrubby, she said. Uh, and uh, then she said, I love my stencils, but storing them is a pain in the backside. So I will show you how I store my stencils. And again, I don't have a great solution to this because stencils are hard to store. So... Basically, what I've done, if you've seen my scrap room tours, and look, you can even see with this camera angle where I store them. I just store them in these. These are Becky Higgins page protector. When you buy a big package of Becky Higgins page protectors, they come in these boxes. And I just have two halves. They, they come like in nested boxes. So I just have two halves. It, it looks like I have two lids here. Um, and I just store them in that in those boxes and then I just slide them into a shelf. This is the best way that I could come up with to store my stencils. Recently, before I did my last scrap room rearrange, which wasn't all that long ago, I keep, this is like 2016 has been the year of changing my scrap room. So um, recently when I recently changed my scrap room. I did a search of how people were storing their stencils. And there was once, there's people are storing them lots of different ways. Lots of people uh, slip them into page protectors like I have here. And uh, these are some homemade stencils that I have. Uh, and then they put them in a binder or they hang them on something. And um, sometimes people will file them like in a filing system with hanging folders. Uh, and, and kind of store them that way. One of the solutions that I really love for storing your stencils is people will, let me just grab one to show. So let's look at this one for example. So what people will do is you can buy these clear hangers that allow you, they have like a little hook and they're, pla and they're plastic and they're adhesive. And so you pull the backing off and then you stick it onto something and uh, it gives a little hanger on it. And so, um, what I've what I saw people doing on YouTube and on blogs and stuff online and on Pinterest was connecting those little hangers onto their stencils. They hang them on a rod or a hook. I think I really like the idea of having like a rod and hanging a whole bunch of stencils on it and then you could browse it. And I think that would be a really great way to store your stencils. I can't figure out where I would do that in my room or how I would cuz I would want it close to here and I just haven't worked out. That might be a solution that I'll use at some point in the future, but for now I've kind of given up on changing my way of storing. So I will show you what I do now, although I'm not 100% happy with it. You're right, they do get scrubby, especially, I think I know what scrubby means. I don't know, maybe it's an Australian thing, but it sounds like I know what it means. Mixed up and tangled up, I'm thinking. <laughs> um, so yes, they do get tangled up. Hello. So I store, <laughs> you guys, I'm totally going to cut out what just happened there. That was ridiculous. Anyhow, um, <laughs> I've got uh, my stencils stored here. And when they're in their original packaging, they're, way, they're really easy to store because they don't get tangled up at all. Or when you put them in page protectors, they're also easy to store because they don't get tangled up. So maybe that's a solution is to just, um, like, I... I'm not going to repackage them because I don't do that. I hate packaging. Uh, but if you were to stick this in something looser, it would be a little bit easier to manage. So maybe just putting them into page protectors and putting them in the box might help. But I think what Shell is referring to is that when you have a whole bunch of stencils all together in a box like this, they get kind of like tangled up in each other and it's hard to see what you have and then you pick them up and they're stuck to each other and that sort of thing. 
So, and they're fairly sturdy, but still, I can imagine, you know, they're they're only going to take so much uh, shaking and and so on before they start to break, especially when you have some paper ones like I do. I use this one as a as a stencil. It's one of those uh, die uh, laser cut pieces of paper from Basic Gray from the Origins collection way back when. So I use that as a stencil as well. So this is how I store my stencils. I do have two trays. So I have one that is dedicated to the large stencils, thus stencils large. And I keep that on my top shelf. And then I have one that is has a label that says stencil small. And you guessed it, there are small stencils in it. So this one has all of my um, beautiful stencils that I bought and haven't used yet. Ooh, they're on their way, I'm gonna be using them soon. Um, as well as anything that's six by six or smaller. I'm sorry, I'm out of frame here. And also all of these Tim Holtz ones live in this, in this uh, place as well. So yeah, this is all my small ones. This is one of my favorites. and So yeah, they do get grubby, especially the uh, small ones because they tangle up more because there's more room for them to move around and get tangled. So that is my not so great storage solution to, uh, to stencils. If anybody out there watching this has any ideas about stencil storage, please share them with the rest of us because we would love to hear what works for you. Everybody's different and what works for me might not work for other people. So let us know if you use one of the storage solutions that I talked about today or if you have a whole new one, I'd love to hear about it. Next question is from Mirna. Myrna won our challenge this month, so Myrna is a lucky girl. She's getting some gelatos from me. Myrna has a question about the Caterpillar Crop, which is my small Caterpillar trimmer. I got it because actually Tracy Ferguson got it and was talking about it on my Facebook group. And I, like, it was one of those things that I sort of knew it existed, but I didn't really pay attention to it and when she posted it I was just like I need to own that so I instantly just went and bought it like that moment it's I don't usually make big purchases that impulsively but um, this thing has totally changed my life because look at how light it is I can hold it with one hand which is really important when I'm doing process videos because I keep it right here and it fits perfectly on top of this storage thing, uh, which is one of those wheelie carts from Recollections. And so it fits there perfectly. And when I'm here scrapbooking and my, ca and my camera is up there pointing down, I can easily just kind of reach over, set it up, and you guys have seen me do that, right? So I think what Myrna is asking is, and you might have already gotten a color caterpillar by now, I can't, I can't quite remember, but she mentioned... Um, do I mind pulling out the arm to use it? Because she has a guillotine pr a guillotine cutter that she that it sounds like it has an arm and she doesn't like pulling out the arm to use it. And so I, it sounded to me like she was thinking about getting the caterpillar crop, but she's not sure about the arm. So for me personally, I don't do a whole lot of measuring with this. I do mostly just, I'm looking for perpendicular tri trimming with this. So I want cuts at a right angle is all the, the only time that I ever use this. And so I, sometimes I'll roughly use the ruler and I also use it when I'm trimming down a layout to mat it on a piece of 12 by 12 cardstock or paper. So if that's the case, then, you know, I do use the ruler to go to uh, 11 and a half or 11 and, and a quarter or whatever it is that I'm using for my sizing for my mat. Um, so I do use it then, but for the most part, I don't really measure. I do put this out though, because the, uh, the edge that keeps your paper flat so that it will cut at a right angle down here, uh, needs to be, if I'm cutting a really large piece of paper, I need the, the arm out so that it'll cut straight. Um, I'm going to go and get my Caterpillar Pro. So this big boy is my Caterpillar Pro. And if I already had the Caterpillar Crop, I would not have bought the Caterpillar Pro. But the Caterpillar Crop did not exist when I bought this. So I bought this. And I really love it. And I loved it. 
I didn't use it quite as often because it's so heavy. It is definitely a two-hand carrying job and um, it's heavy. It's made out of metal, whereas this one is made out of like a lightweight but very sturdy plastic. And so this one is just a lot less conducive to my workflow for doing process videos. So I do still use it if I ever had to do any kind of measuring. So for example, whenever I'm making card bases or card blanks or anything that needs a certain size or repetitive uh, trimming, I always use this guy. And I keep it in the same spot in my scrap room, which you can see in my overall scrapic, scrapic, epic scrap room tour. You can see where this guy lives and I just walk over and use it and then come back. So this, the nice thing about it is that it measures to more than 12 inches. It goes out to uh, 12 and 7 eighths of an inch and it's, it's just nice and big and you don't have to use the arm. This is quite a bit more expensive though than the Caterpillar Crop, but neither of them are really inexpensive tools. So they're quite an investment. The nice thing about the Caterpillar Crop, if you're interested in using it for measuring, is that the spot where there are no measurements, so there's always a little gap between the main part of the tool and the fold-out uh, ruler that doesn't have any measurements. So the last measure, the last exact measurement that you get is six and a half. Well, no, six and a half, six and six and six eighths. I don't know. Why do people do things in eighths? I don't understand. <laughs> I like the metric system. Um, <laughs> you know, I'll show you. So you get to me you can measure all the way up to this whatever this line is here. It's more than a half. Good lord, I'm looking very uninformed and uneducated here. And then it picks right up at the seven inch mark. So so what I'm saying is that that's a pretty small gap. Whew, I do have videos about my Caterpillar Crop and about my Caterpillar Pro. Oh look, you can see my kitties after all. At least two of them. Ah, Okay, so now let's move on to the questions from the Facebook group. So Betsy asks, when do you call it a day on older scrap items that you have had in your stash forever? I seem to hang on to everything and it can be overwhelming. I think that that's a really common problem for scrapbookers. Finding that balance between having enough stash that you always have access to the items that you need to make a page feel complete or finished, but not having too much stuff that you just kind of like don't know where to start. And I think that it that place is different for everybody. So you have to find your own sweet spot between having too much and having too little. And I think that your organization, le your organization level and space and storage s solutions really play into that. So for me, I, I do have a lot of stuff in my room. I also have a lot of capacity in my room to store things because I have it pretty well set up with lots of cubes and storage uh, systems that work for me. So I have the capacity to hold on to more than what probably a lot of other people would. And I mean, I have this space, so I might as well hang on to it. I figure I'd rather, for many things, I figure I'd rather hang on to it and, you know, I could always give it away at another time or maybe, and then I'll have it when I need it than to get rid of things just to have empty drawers. Like I don't, I don't, I have this space, I'm here. So I might as well fill the drawers that I have. Although I don't like them to be too full. So um, I like them to actually be half full or less than half full so that I can rummage through easily and find everything. I hate a full drawer. I will avoid a full drawer. So I try to not fill anything. So I think that if, if you know, you kind of have to have a sense of what the capacity is for your room to hold or your storage place, whether it's a closet or a room or a drawer or a cabinet. You have to have a sense of what's the capacity, meaning not what's the most it can hold, but what's the capacity that it can hold and still work for you. So if you're like me and you need everything to be half full in order to be able to figure out what you have and find what you need, then that's that's where you need to keep yourself. And then so I will do things like set limits 
for example, I have six by six paper storage over there and it's in a, it's in a little um, shelf. And once that shelf is full, I need to get rid of more um, paper pads. So it's, so I will never have more than that amount. So I just go right now it's completely full. So if I were to buy a new six by six paper pad, I'd put it in the new side and pull out one from the old side and put it in my giveaway pile. So that's what I do. The other thing that I do is I tend to purge as I go. I do sometimes have big purges. I haven't had a big purge in a long time uh, because I try to, I know what I, I know what I need and what I like now. And so I, I purge as I go. So every month when I get a new kit, if I'm, if I'm kit scrapping, when I get the new kit, I take it out and use it, but I put away my old kit and Usually that involves de-kitting. Every once in a while I'll hold on to a kit in kit format and pull it out again as a kit. Um, but for the most part, I de-kit at the end of the month. So what I do when I'm de-kitting, you've probably seen it on my recap videos, is I look through what was in the kit, what's left over, and anything that I know I'll use, I put it where it belongs. So I'll put stickers with stickers, I'll put stamps with stamps, I'll put um, paper with paper scraps in my scrap drawers and that sort of thing. Um, if there are any embellishments that I'm pretty sure I will never use, it goes straight into my back room in my big box that I keep of giveaway things. So... Um, if it, you know, maybe there was a set of tassels in the kit and I used one of the tassels and I decided that those tassels aren't for me, I'm never going to use them again, I'll put them in there. Even if there's like a, if there's a slight chance I'll use it, I'll still put it in there because I have enough other stuff. I really like, what are the chances that I'm going to say to myself, I absolutely need a tassel right now. Nothing else will do. Usually it's like, I need something with dimension. And if I don't have a tassel, then I'll just get something else, right? So <laughs> we don't have all that many tassel emergencies around here. So that's what I mean by just kind of like purging as I go and trying to keep my room so that it's always working for me. And I find that part of the joy of scrapbooking is keeping this place working in an efficient way and keeping on top of it. I find that very satisfying and fulfilling and it's kind of part of my hobby. So that's how I do it. Thanks for your question, Betsy. Shay wants to know if would would you ever do super simple layouts like no layers or triple embellishments, just very clean and simple. And I have done simple layouts. I've done them a few times. I don't think I've done them recently. I tend to to scrapbook more simple layouts over the holidays. It would take me a while to find them, but I have a layout. I'll try to find it on Flickr and if I can find it I'll show it right here. That is really just a title and a photo. I'll try to find that and link it in right here and you can have a look at that but I don't do that very often. I just I love playing with paper so unless if I'm trying to scrap really quickly or if I have something that I really want to highlight so maybe I have a really beautiful title piece like a, an elaborately cut die cut title, then I might, um, I'm, I might use that and a photo and maybe one embellishment or something or one layer. Uh, but typically I'm not very clean and simple, but there are lots and lots of clean and simple scrapbookers out there that you can check out. Libby says, I remember you used to post Project Life process videos. Do you still do Project Life? If not, what do you do with all your photos? that don't make it into your 12 by 12 layouts. Thank you for your question. So Libby, your question brings up my big problem area in scrapbooking. This is, I feel like I kind of have it all under control, except for Project Life. So um, your question is a good one and I'm glad that you asked it. So basically, I love Project Life and I love doing Project Life, but I only love doing Project Life occasionally and I love having Project Life all the time. So it's, uh, that's really hard for me to find a way to resolve that conflict of wanting it all but only being able to do some of it because I only scrapbook for fun. I don't scrapbook for a chore. So, um, and that's just a personal decision that I have made. It's not wrong to say I want to get this done for a certain reason and then work really hard and, and stick with it. But I am a big believer in giving up when something isn't working for you. And Project Life has been like that. I have completed two full years of Project 
project life that were very detailed, elaborate, almost daily. I wasn't scrapbooking almost daily, but I covered almost daily. I, I, I project lifed every single week of my life for two years. And that was a lot. And it was rewarding and it was fun. And it was, um, I love the projects that I ended up having. Like, I love the albums. And then after that, I tried doing it monthly and I tried doing it occasionally. And then I, and then after I did that and I thought, you know, do what works for you. And I was good with it. And I was totally fine with the fact that I rarely did project life and I do it when I wanted and didn't do it when I didn't want to. And I was happy. Then somebody pulled out my old project life albums and started looking through them. And I got all sentimental and said, Oh, I wish I still did that. Our life has actually changed. So what I found was that those two years were right back to back. They were adjacent years. And so I found that there weren't a whole lot of differences from one of those albums to the other. And so I thought, why am I doing all of this to just cover the same, like we do the same things every year. So but now a couple of years have gone by and my life has really changed. So last year I had this idea that I'm going to get back into project life and I'm going to do it more regularly. And that lasts like three weeks. And then I fell off the wagon and then I, and then I'd say, Oh, right. I was supposed to do that. I'm going to get back into it. I'm going to be hardcore. And that would last two weeks. And then I drop it again and I come back to it and drop it and come back. And finally, I just, I don't even know where I stand on it anymore. I'm so divided. I want to do it. Well, I want to have it, but I don't want to do it. And in order to have it, I have to do it. So unless if I can like pay somebody else to do my project life for me, which makes no sense at all, um, I need to figure out what to do about this. I think that what I'm probably going to end up doing is um, scrapbooking, like doing project life as if I did it every week, but only doing it sometimes. So, so that's different than my other approach, which was to do it monthly and I found when I did it monthly, I was just glossing over too many things. I think that what I might do is do almost like do week in the life, but just do it all through the year at different times. Like maybe next week I might do week in the life. And so I do like project life as if I was doing it on a weekly basis, capturing almost all of my week and then just drop it for a couple of months and then do another week. And then drop it for a couple months. And that, I think, is the best way that I would be able to get the level of detail that I love to see in my project life without having to commit to a project that feels too much like work after you do it for a couple of weeks in a row. So I think that's where I'm at, but I'm not entirely sure. And I haven't put my money where my mouth is on that yet, so I'm not entirely sure, as I said. But we'll see. Definitely for me, doing a monthly summary type of version of Project Life is not what I want. It's not different enough from my 12 by 12 pages to make it a worthwhile endeavor. And I will certainly do process videos when I do my pocket scrapbooking for sure, for sure, because I love process videos. So you, the second part of your question, Libby, was what do you do with all your photos that don't make it into your 12 by 12 layouts? They just stay on my phone. And I use uh, Instagram as a memory keeping strategy as well. So, so it's all there as well. So Therese asks, when you put your completed layouts into your albums, do you file them in chronological order? I'm trying to file mine in chronological order, but often I'm finding that I have to rearrange so many pages within my album to get the new layout in the right order. Thanks. I don't. I mostly scrapbook in chronological order, so therefore my albums tend to be in chronological order. So I just put them in in the order that I made them and then they end up landing mostly in chronological order and sometimes there's like what I would consider like a throwback page that is from a couple of years ago or several months ago or just a picture that popped up in my sometimes my Facebook feed you know how Facebook will say you know three years ago here are your memories uh, that will remind me of a photo that I never did scrapbook or it might that photo or that memory might give me an idea for a scrapbooking page and then I'll go into my Instagram, find the photo, print it up and scrap it. So every once in a while you will see a throwback um, layout in my album, but mostly not chronological. And I think the part of the reason that I scrapbook that way is because of the very problem that you're describing there. I would not have the patience to be able to rearrange things all the time. I hate albums. Like I, I never look at them. I don't like putting projects in them. 
The album part is my least favorite part of scrapbooking. So now Ro has a question for me. How often do you de-stash and what is the one technique you can't skip on from your pages? One technique I can't skip. How often do I de-stash? I think I already answered that question in one of my other questions. Something I can't skip. I think that a technique that I can't skip, I mean, I was going to say splatters, but every once in a while I have a layout that doesn't have ink splatters. And I was going to say outlining, but every once in a while I have a page that doesn't have outlining. I think one thing that I really don't like to skip, but I sometimes do, is sewing. I think that sewing just finishes off your page and adds such beautiful detail. Almost every single layout that I have that doesn't have sewing on, when I look at it and think, could I have added sewing? Almost always the answer is yes. So I think that sewing could theoretically be the answer to this question. Outlining is something I do often, but not every single time. And ink splatter is another thing. And layering. I guess there. I guess that there's probably not a single page that doesn't have any layering at all on it. So yeah, that's my kind of long-winded answer to your question. Thank you for your question. Uh